Hello, my name is Patrick McKeown. I'm from Ireland and over the next few minutes we're going to talk about the importance of nose breathing in children or conversely we're, talk we're going to talk about and highlight the detrimental impact of mouth breathing and oral breathing in children. Now this is a very very um, common habit in children. For example in some research papers it shows that up to 50% of children breathe through their mouths and I'm not talking about breathing through the mouth just for a couple of minutes but it's prolonged mouth breathing. So when the child, for example, is watching TV, um, when the child is asleep, when the child is doing their homework, when the child is in school, when the child is doing physical exercise. So that the child, it's really recognizing a child that if they have developed a habit of breathing through their mouth, we want to look at what are the effects of that. Now the first paper that I'm going to look at is by a dentist called Dr. Josh Jefferson and it's published in the journal ADHD and it goes on children who mouth breathe typically do not sleep well causing them to be tired during the day and possibly unable to concentrate on academics if the child becomes frustrated in school he or she may exhibit behavior problems there is no question that mouth breathing leads to poor sleep and poor quality of sleep causes the child to be tired during the day and a tired child is more than, you know, they're likely to be more frustrated in school. They're more likely, for example, than to have maybe behavioral issues, but it's not necessarily the behavior, the behavioral issue that's the problem. The issue could stem back down to their mouth breathing. Let's look at if a child presents themselves with ADHD, let's look at sleep. Many of these children are misdiagnosed with attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity. And in addition, mouth breathing can cause poor oxygen concentration in the bloodstream. We know from our work that when you breathe through your mouth, the oxygen uptake in the blood is reduced, but also oxygen delivery to the cells is reduced. And you know that oxygen is king. But mouth breathing doesn't enhance oxygen uptake. The key is, in order to help improve and you know, to have normal oxygen uptake and normal oxygen delivery, the key is to breathe through the nose. Another aspect of breathing through the mouth is the development of the face. So a child that breathes through the mouth, they tend to develop a more longer face because literally the whole face sinks downwards. Um, and part of the reason is because when we're breathing through the nose, the tongue is resting in the roof of the mouth. And the tongue, by exerting a pressure, is helping to shape the top jaw of the maxilla. So the top jaw then becomes U-shaped. And a U-shaped top jaw is ideal for housing all teeth but also with the tongue and the roof of the mouth, it helps to drive the lower part of the face forward. Now, conversely, if the mouth is open, the tongue is either midway or on the floor of the mouth. So we have the lips exerting a pressure inwards, we have the cheeks exerting a pressure inwards, but we don't have the counteracting force of the tongue driving the face forward. In short, a mouth breathing child doesn't develop the same attractive features that a nose breathing kid can do. In other words, you know, if we want to ensure that our children, and every parent wants this for their child, that we want our children to grow up happy um, with good development, but also with good facial structure, we do want our child to be attractive. Nose breathing is the key to achieving this. So I'm going to give you a piece from my book, Buteco Meets Dr. Mew. A good looking face is determined by a strong, sturdy chin, developed jaws, high cheekbones, good lips, correct nose size and straight teeth. When a face develops correctly, it follows that the teeth will be straight. Straight teeth do not create a good looking face, but a good looking face will create straight teeth. Now, I have a daughter of five years of age. The one thing that I'm going to be looking at is, what can I do to assist in normal development of the jaws? And already we are embarking on the route of functional appliances because we want to make sure that you know, she, for example, she has inherited my genes, unfortunately. And my genes are narrow, narrow upper palate. And of course, I have all of the, those bad habits as a kid. I was a mouth breather, etc. cetera. Um, and she has my genetic traits. So I'm trying to, what can I do to help my daughter? We have, we have her definitely ensure that she's nasal breathing. So I'm always consistently, wa con constantly watching her, getting her to breathe through the nose, getting the tongue into the roof of the mouth. We've also started early orthodontic intervention by having an appliance there to assist with normal facial growth. I'm not going to leave it until my child is 12 years of age. You'll see from the papers later on 
12 years of age is too late. The earlier we start getting children to breathe through the nose, the earlier we have them, you know, as a dental appliance that's so easy to wear, minimally invasive, um, and we can get the child growing on the correct part. This example here is how a face should grow. You see the good definition of the cheekbones. You see the wide facial structure. You see the forward development of the mandible. Good airway size, because if the face grows the way it should go, grow, the airways are good. The nasal cavity is a good size because the face is broad. The airways are a good size. When the airways are a good size, there's less of a risk of obstructive sleep apnea later in life. And to drive this home, um, I'm going to give you an example from Dr. John Mew. He's an orthodontist that's living quite close to me in the UK. And a few years ago, um, he was in a restaurant and he saw this child with his mom and the child had his mouth open. So Dr. Mew went over to the mom and he says, he says it would be really good if you could help, um, you know, encourage your child to breathe through the nose. And the mom said, okay, thanks very much and kind of thought no more of it. So it was 15 years later um, that the mom came to Dr. Mew's surgery and he says, she said to him, well, did you remember me? Well, he says, no, not quite. But she said, you told me to ensure that my child breathed through his nose. And she says, if he didn't breathe through his nose, he'd have crooked teeth. And she says, well, you weren't quite right about that because his teeth are actually fairly straight. So Dr. Mew says, OK, well, I'd love to see your son. Bring him in. We'll take photographs. So here is his teeth. And as Dr. Mew says, OK, not quite straight, but they're not too bad. But the problem wasn't the, the teeth. The issue was the face. We have to look at the facial features here. But of course, mom, as most parents, and the vast majority of parents, and many healthcare professionals, unfortunately, they're not aware of the negative impact of oral breathing and mouth breathing on the development of the child's face. So let's look at this boy's face. This boy was a mouth breather most of his life. He's got a flaccid lower lip. He's got tired looking eyes. His nose is slightly bent. His jaws are set back. And this could be avoided. These are the typical features from mouth breathing that we're trying to change. And again, just here's an example here. You see the exact same things. We see children like this all the time. However, when I see them, I see them when they're 20 years of age. It's too late. So by leaving the child, having their mouth open from the age of three right up to whatever age, but the earlier we can get the mouth closed, the better. And why do we have crooked teeth? Like of all species on Earth, humans are most affected by crooked teeth. The traditional explanation is that the child inherited the smaller jaws from his or her mother and the larger teeth from his or her father. Could this be true? And I was reading a very interesting book. It was written by another d dentist here from Colorado called Dr. Halle Huggins. And he said, a horse and a donkey. If you cross them, you get a fine work animal. He says, I used them a lot on the farm. But he says, guess what? He says, I never saw a mule with a horse's teeth and a donkey's jaw. In other words, if we get two animals, if we got two dogs, and if we cross them, the offspring, so the pup, it doesn't mean that the pup is going to inherit the larger teeth from the father and the smaller jaws from the mother. So as it regards a genetic argument, um, because I often hear that, you know, crooked teeth is primarily genetic. There, of course, there's going to be some influence of genetics. But in the field, it's now estimated by, by some experts to be 5%. So it seems to be the combination of environment and genetics, or more commonly known as epigenetics. Child has the mouth open, and it's the genetic trait. So it's the mixture of mouth breathing and tongue sucking and incorrect swallow, and it's the influence of these habits on the, ge on the genes that are resulting in the, the facial profile. So it's not that every child has their mouth open, develops such horrendous changes, but some do. But there's probably no question about it that every kid that has its mouth open, it is going to have some impact on that child. As John Flutter said, Dr. John Flutter, um, all mouth breeders develop crooked teeth. And we know this information for a long time. Going back to the 1960s, another dentist, Apple P. Harvold, he recognized that mouth breathing, oral respiration associated with obstruction of the nasal airway is a common finding among patients seeking orthodontic treatment. He recognized that the kids coming into him seeking orthodontic treatment were mouth breathers. 
So to further, you know, to find out more about this, he got groups of young monkeys, rhesus monkeys. And in the experimental group, he surgically blocked their noses with silicon nose plugs. So he forced the monkeys, he forced some of the monkeys to mouthbreed. And he found that, you know, the monkeys who mouthbreed, they develop crooked teeth and other facial deformities, including a lowering of the chin, a steeper mandibular plane angle, an increase in the gonial angle as compared with the eight control animals. In other words, he was able to produce the same dental irregularities in the monkeys as found in humans. How did he do it? He blocked the monkey's noses. So nasal obstruction, it forces normal nasal breathing into mouth breathing. When the nose is blocked, the kid, the child is going to mouth breathe. And numerous clinical observations of exper and experiments showed that this apparently benign change has in fact immediate and or deferred cascading effects on multiple physiological and behavioral functions. And this is taken from a paper that was published in the International Journal of Pediatrics. We have to consider, you know, and this information is known by thousands of dentists, functional orthodontists, and myofunctional therapists, mouth closed li with lips gently together, three quarters of the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth with the tip of the tongue placed before the front teeth but not touching the, the front teeth, breathing through the nose and correct swallowing. And the importance of this is when we consider 60% of the growth of the face takes place during the first four years of life and 90% takes place by the age of 12. So the window of opportunity is, is relatively brief. And also, for effective orthodontic therapy to take place, we need to ensure that the child or teenager breathes through their nose. Because otherwise, you could, you know, in saying, like, getting the teeth straight, but forgetting about breathing through the nose, um, there's a relatively high chance of relapse. And I've heard from some, some industry experts that the relapse could be as high as 75%. I'm going to bring you back to Dr. Josh Jefferson, who I introduced you to you at the start, and I'm going to conclude it. If mouth breathing is treated early, its negative effects on facial and dental development and the medical and social problems associated with it can be reduced or averted. All I say is, you know, I've been looking at this field for many years. I have seen the negative effects of mouth breathing. I know it's an innocuous habit. I know it doesn't get the attention it deserves. In time, I believe it will do because it cannot be ignored any longer. This is well documented in the literature. We've got hundreds of medical profession for professionals talking about it and advocating the importance of nose breathing. And it's time that we started getting this information into the general public. And Dr. Mike Milligan is just one of those professionals helping to get this information out there. And in turn, we can help many children grow the way they should grow and not to be impeded by a simple habit that was overlooked which shouldn't have been overlooked. Further information is available from butecoclinic.com or directly from Dr. Mike Milligan. Thank you for listening.